so what this online clip does is that it sort of brings together all the things we've learned so far and combines it to help us identify global maxima in a multivariate constraint optimization problem. This is not straightforward and therefore my decision to produce this as a video this lecture rather than give it because I will totally anticipate that you'll have to go back and rewatch and pause. So let's recap what we know so far. We are having a maximization problem here. We want to maximize f over two input arguments x1 and x2 but subject to a constraint which we formulate in, formulate in this form a function g of x1 and x2 and that has to be larger than zero. The Lacrosian technique consists of forming this what we call the Lacrosian function which is a combination of the function we want to optimize plus lambda times the constraint. Now this lambda parameter is what we call the Lagrangian multiplier. It indicates how much we can improve ourselves if we could relax the constraint. So What we have learned so far is how to find a solution to this problem. In particular, we've written down the necessary conditions for a particular point x asterisk to be a solution to the problem. But note, necessary. That's not the same as sufficient. So we will be looking for points that meet these conditions, but we will not be sure that that point is going to be the solution to our problem, i.e. the maximum to our constraint maximization problem. Nevertheless, this is how we start. Here are our four, we call them Lagrangian conditions. And they are that the first order partial derivative with respect to x1 okay, so it's the same as dl delta l over delta x1 and then here we have delta l over delta x2 so the first order partial derivatives of our Lagrangian functions ought to be equal to zero also our constraint has to be met that means that g function at a potential solution x asterisk has to be larger or equal to zero. It can never be negative. The Lagrangian multiplier has to be larger or equal to zero. We discussed in the previous lecture that if that wasn't the case, we could improve our situation. And lambda times g is equal to zero. This is what we call the complementary slackness condition. And it implies that either lambda is equal to zero, in which case we are operating unconstrained, or lambda is larger than zero, in which case the constraint is binding, but then we are operating exactly at the constraint, meaning that g is equal to zero. So from here we know that either lambda is equal to zero or g at our optimal point is equal to zero. So what we got to do is we got to find all solutions that solve these four conditions or that satisfy these four conditions and these will be combinations of x1 and x2 in our case because we have two arguments and lambda. And the way how we go about this was that we first try solving lambda equal to zero. Right? So that was the unconstrained problem.
and then we would solve this. And when we are looking for possible solutions with lambda larger than zero, we will be looking on the boundary of the constraint. These two solution paths could have given us zero, uh, sorry, these two solution paths could have given us one, two, three, or even more solutions if the function is very complicated and perhaps is a high, higher order polynomial. What we then ought to do is we want to find the solution which gives us the largest value of f. After all, this is what we want to maximize. And this is just a manual task of plugging in potential x1, x2 values and seeing which one results in larger f. So, what we have also learned is this. If our constraint G is a compact constraint, then these necessary conditions also turn into sufficient conditions. What's that mean? That if you know that a constraint is compact, once you have done these steps, identified all possible solutions and found the best solution, then you know you have found the solution to the problem, that point at which your constraint optimization problem is maximized. So this is if the constraint is compact. So it turns out that the constraint optimization example one, and you will find a PDF file on Blackboard, is exactly such a case. Here is what we want. We want to maximize this function subject to this constraint. So this function here, so this is f, and from here it follows that g is equal to 16 minus x1 squared minus x2 squared. f is a linear function. That means we are talking about a plane. Now look at this picture. You can see the straight lines. These are the level curves for f. Okay, so you see the level curves for f and lighter colors are higher function values. So we are improving ourselves as we go into this direction in terms of the function. And you can see that is for larger x1, here we have x1, and here we have x2. So for larger x1, but smaller x2. All right, so here we have positive x2, here negative x2, here negative x1, here positive x1. So in this direction, we're going, we're increasing x1 but decreasing x2. And you can see that we have a positive coefficient to x1 and a negative one to x2. So that makes sense. So you know that unconstrained, we actually have no solution here because it's a plane. It will continue increasing in one direction. But we have this constraint here. And this constraint basically says all that we need that our x1 and x2 combinations have to be in or on a circle around the zero, zero point. It says zero, zero here. Around the zero, zero point in and on a circle with radius four. So the shaded area here is the allowed area. Okay, The darker shaded area is the allowed area under the constraint. So what happened here is that since we had a compact constraint, the Lagrangian conditions were also the sufficient conditions. And when we implemented the Lagrangian conditions, we would find a point here. This point here met all the Lagrangian conditions. And that means that in this particular case, the constraint actually enforces a constraint maximum, although in the unconstrained 
case there is no maximum. So this was a case where the compactness of the constraint guaranteed that there was a solution. A, it guaranteed the solution, I should say, and it made the Lagrangian conditions also sufficient. So let's look at the second example. Again, on Blackboard you can find all the details in a PDF file on this. So what we are now doing is we are maximizing this function, so this is our f, subject to this constraint. So from here we can formulate the constraint that is negative 9 minus 2x1 minus 3x2 and that is large or equal to 0. So this one is just a linear constraint so this is not compact. Let's look first at the shaded area in our graph. You can see the shaded area here. Now it looks like a triangle of course I could draw a line around it but the area of course continues across the boundaries of my plot. So on this side we are okay, on this side we are not okay. And on the line, since we have a closed constraint on the line, we are good as well. So if you solve the Lagrangian conditions, what you find is you find this point here. Okay, uh, you can also see that the level curves at this point will be tangential, the slope of the level curve will be tangential to the actual constraint. But the Lagrangian conditions are not sufficient here. So let's look at the function here. We're having a quadratic function in x1 and x2, both of them negative. Remember that lighter colors are higher values. So we can see that here this point would deliver the highest function value. This would be the unconstrained maximum. But it is outside our allowed area. We have to be on this side of the constraint line. So in this case, however, if you look at the function, how the function behaves inside the constraint, you can tell it will go, the function values will get darker and darker or lower and lower the further we go away. So you can actually tell that this point is the lightest possible, the highest possible value of the function given the constraint. So it turns that this value here is the constraint maximum. So in this case we do have a solution and we did find it using the Lagrangian conditions. So the question is were we lucky in this case or is there anything else about this combination of function and constraint that guaranteed us that the solution which we found with the Lagrangian was also the solution to the problem. So this is what we are now aiming at. We want to provide sufficient conditions for the Lagrange method to solve the problem when the constraint is not compact. So this is a new theorem and it addresses the following solution, the following problem. So solutions to the Lagrangian conditions do not automatically generate the solution to the problem unless so far we have learned if G is compact then we have already learned that 1 to 4 are necessary and sufficient. 
Otherwise, they are not. But here we are now introducing another reason for 1 to 4 to be necessary and sufficient conditions. And this is this case. That is, if the Lagrangian is concave. And in particular, we will see that the Lagrangian will be concave if both F and G are globally concave. So here's the next situation. F and G are globally con concave. Globally concave. That also leads us to conclude that conditions 1 to 4 are necessary and sufficient. So this is basically what this theorem says. So with this, we'll, and a little later we'll think about why this is the case. So let's re-evaluate that constraint optimization example 2, which we looked at before. What about our f and our g? Now f is this one. This is a quadratic function, but negative, because both x1 and x2 enter negatively. That's why we get this nice regular shape for our function. It basically looks a bit like a mountain, with up here being the summit, and that is a concave shape. A concave shape. You could, of course, check the Hessian of f at all values of x. Okay, and you will find that that Hessian is negative semi definite. Then we can look at the g function, the constraint. Now, this is a linear function. Now, we know that linear functions are both concave and convex. So, in this case, f is convex and g is convex. Hence, we are, and therefore, we are covered by the case of our new found theorem. We found f and g to be globally convex, and hence 1 to 4 are necessary and sufficient conditions. And it is for this reason that we can rest calmly in the knowledge that this point which we found using the Lagrangian conditions and details on how to do that in the PDF file, that point is the solution to our problem. This theorem, however, will not always rescue us. So here we have a third case and again all the details are in this PDF file. So here it turns out that in fact there is no solution to the problem. So here is the function we want to maximize. And you can see it's slightly more complicated. It has a cubic term and then two quadratic terms. And here's our constraint. So the constraint, so g of x, let's write it in a way as the Lagrangian method demands us to do it. It's x1 minus x2 is larger or equal to zero. This is a linear constraint and it is concave. So that part of the bargain is okay. But what about the f function? So while g is concave, we also recognize it's non-compact. So let's go back to our little sketch here. So it's not compact. So this condition here doesn't rescue us. g is concave, but let's check whether f is also concave. Because if that was the case, then we knew that the solutions to the Lagrangian conditions would deliver the solution to the problem. But now our f is actually not globally concave. It's the presence of this term, the cubic term, 
that makes that. Cubic functions in general tend to be not concave. They will have concave and convex sections. You have to think about what happens from the what happens through the rest of the function. Uh, something else could happen in that counteracts it. Um, so what you really want to do is you want to check the Hessian of f evaluated at all x's and if we do so and you can check for the details in that file you'll realize it is not globally concave. So that means that the Lagrangian conditions are not sufficient. So nevertheless our Lagrangian conditions let me do this in a different color our Lagrangian conditions have identified this point here x asterisk again details in the PDF file but the question is now is that the solution to our problem look at the constraint the constraint is again the dark shaded area so here we're continuing across that on this side we are not good on this side we are good right, so here we are good here we are not good again lighter colors means higher function values darker colors lower function values and you can see that if we move into this direction here so at for instance x2 equal to 0 and here we have x1 on the axis and if we increase x1 then we're moving into this lighter area with function values larger than at this point. Now, Of course you could verify that once you identified that point you can calculate the function value and you can try any other points. How do you know where to look if you don't have the graphs? Well you see the term that will dominate the function is going to be this one x1 cubed and that will become very large for large x's so you can see that as x1 goes to infinity as we move in here this term will become very very large there's some constraint on what the x2 values can be but you can easily find values for x1 for instance for x2 equal to 0 so this term will fall away which just goes into infinity so this point here it turns out this point is not the solution to the problem so what we've learned from here is that if you cannot establish that, the, that your Lagrangian conditions are necessary and sufficient, you will still use them to identify candidate points. But once you've done so, you will have to evaluate the function in the allowed areas to establish whether that candidate value is indeed the largest possible point. So let's briefly think about why this is the case, why the concavity rescues us. So for Lx to be concave with non-negative alphas it's sufficient for f and g to be concave. Linear combinations with positive, remember L is f of x plus lambda times g of x so positive lim linear combinations of concave functions will be positive again if that lambda was negative that we couldn't conclude this then any candidate value x asterisk satisfies that the gradient function of our Lagrangian with respect to x asterisk is equal to zero. So it is a stationarity point of our Lagrangian functions. And if L is concave, 
then we know that if we have a stationarity point that also has to be the global maximum of that function. That's exactly what we also learned for univariate functions or for the unconstrained case. If our function is concave then we know that any stationarity point we have found will be the global maximum. So what is now the question is whether under these conditions x asterisk maximizing the Lagrangian function also implies that it maximizes the function f assuming that the constraint is met. So this is what we now want to show. So if x asterisk is the global maximum as we said here for the Lagrangian that means global maximum basically is defined by the following condition L at x asterisk is larger or equal than L at all other values of x okay for all x okay in other words there is no other value of x which delivers a Lagrangian function larger than L x asterisk and of course the Lagrangian function is just a combination of f and g multiplied by lambda and the same over here f and g times lambda so if that is true, this inequality is true, then we can you can basically take a look at these two parts. We are looking now at the yellow inequality here. And what we do is we we can bring the f to the left hand side and we bring the lambda g asterisk to the right hand side and what you end up with is this inequality. So f at x asterisk minus f of x is larger equal to lambda times g of x minus g x asterisk. So uh, here we replicate what we have just found. So now we know that there are really only two conditions we need to consider. Firstly, I should say, at this stage we haven't established what we want. We wanted to show that the x asterisk which maximizes is the global maximum of L is also the global maximum of x. So what we want here is a large or equal to zero. This is what we want. That's what we are shooting for, but we don't have it yet. For this stage, at this stage, we still have this guy here. But now we need to only consider two cases because we know that lambda is either going to be zero or it's going to be larger than zero. So if lambda is equal to zero, then automatically this right hand part will collapse to be equal to zero. So that means that's pretty good because that then implies indeed that f of x asterisk minus f of x is larger or equal to zero and that means that x asterisk is also the global maximum of f because it's larger or equal to any other value of f at any other value of x. What about the case where lambda is larger than zero? then we know that from the complementary slackness condition of our Lagrangian condition if we are working at the constraint then the g at our optimal point is going to be equal to zero. So that means that this right hand term here will simplify to this because this will be zero so all we are left with is lambda times g. But we also know that at the constraint g is larger. We also know, sorry, from the complementary slackness condition that this guy here 
has to be large or equal to zero. We know the lambda is larger, we know that g is larger, so therefore we know that this is going to be large or equal to zero and we are exactly where we want it to be. So for both cases we have shown that this term here is larger than zero which is basically the definition of a global maximum for x asterisk. It means that x asterisk is the global maximizer of f because the f value at x asterisk is going to be larger or equal to f of x for all other x. So that was just the underpinning of why that second way, let's go back and show that. Remember we had two ways to establish that the Lagrangian conditions are necessary and sufficient if g is compact or if f and g are both globally concave. And what we've just done is established why that delivers the maximum. So with this under your belt, what you should be doing is you should work through the fourth example yourself. So this is an interesting example because the constraint has a variable, contains a variable. Okay, it is something like I don't think that's exactly the constraint, but it's something like 3x1 plus 2x2 or to be smaller or equal to m rather than an actual value. So you just have to carry a variable, but treat it as a constant. And on Friday's lecture, 29th of November, we will be working through in detail through this example. Now you should test what you've learned. Here we have a table with information on whether the constraint is either compact or not, yes for compact, no for not compact, whether it's concave, yes or no, globally I should add, and whether our function we want to maximize f is globally concave or not. So we are ha having eight possible combinations here and then depending on this combination of information you should think about whether the Lagrangian conditions are necessary and or sufficient. So pause this clip and try and solve it yourself. So there, there's one thing we immediately know. The Lagrangian conditions are necessary. So we put an N in here because these are always necessary regardless of what we know about the constraint and the function we want to maximize, they are always necessary, the Lagrangian conditions. But sometimes they will be also sufficient. So let's try and identify when that is. The easiest case is the following. Whenever the constraint is compact and I didn't write that down here, the function is continuous, then we know that the Lagrangian conditions are also sufficient. Right, so this is enough to establish that the Lagrangian conditions are not only necessary but sufficient, it means once you've found the solution for the Lagrangian conditions, you know that will solve the problem. However, there is one other case where the Lagrangian conditions are necessary and sufficient and that is where both the constraint and the function are globally concave. That's this case, in which case the Lagrangian conditions are also necessary and sufficient. 
in all other cases these three cases here in all other cases the Lagrangian conditions are only necessary